Okay, welcome. Welcome to Preparing for Hour of Code with easy resources and tips. Uh, the session today is um, by WHRO Education. Uh, for those of you who don't know, WHRO is local in Norfolk, and we are actually owned by 21 ownership school divisions along the coast of Virginia. We provide all sorts of wonderful resources to our K-12 teachers all over Virginia. And um, one of the things that we provide is free professional develop development for all of the educators in those ownership divisions. So here we are today. Um, today, we're going to talk about Hour of Code. And I expect that there are probably a range of learners in here, some people who have never heard of Hour of Code, um, some who have heard of it but are a little unfamiliar. Maybe some of you have participated in Hour of Code in the past. Um, no matter where you are on that sequence, um, there's something here for you today. So with that, there are a couple of quick housekeeping things before we really dive into the coding. Um, if you have questions at any time today during this presentation, feel free to ask them. You can ask them in the chat. You can ask them in the Q&A section. I am the only presenter in this uh, session today, so I may not see your question right away, but no worries if I happen to miss it while I'm talking. I will make sure that I check the chat and the Q&A, and at the end, I will definitely answer any questions that I missed throughout the presentation. Feel free to ask any question at any time, though. You will receive a certificate of participation for being here today for one hour. Um, I will have, so typically, if you've been to one of my sessions before, usually you get an email from me um, a few days after the session with the um, link to my slides and a survey and um, a certificate. I'm trying something a little bit new today. We have a brand new survey system that we're trying out. So at the end of this survey, I'm going to show you a QR code and I'm going to give you a link, <laughs> excuse me. And when you take that brief, it's very brief, just a couple of minutes tops. <laughs> when you take that survey, the end of the survey is going to provide you with the link to my slides, as well as a link to a certificate that you can download or print. So um, hopefully all goes smooth. If, if it doesn't, for whatever reason, if that survey gives you trouble and you don't get your certificate, feel free to um, email me and, and we'll get that all straightened out. But everything should run smoothly with that new system. Okay. My name is Janie Everett. I'm the Educational Technology Manager at WHRO Public Media. And there's my email address, just in case you need anything from me. Um, as the Educational Technology Manager, I provide professional development for all of the educators in our ownership school divisions at WHRO. Uh, some of those sessions are in person, either at our station, or I travel out to schools and do sessions. And a lot of them, um, especially in the past two years are virtual, like the one that we are doing tonight. So if you're ever interested in any sort of professional development, especially related to technology after tonight, feel free to reach out to me and I can certainly do a session for your, your district or your individual school. Before coming to WHRO, I was a teacher myself. I was an elementary school teacher. I've taught at uh, Norfolk Public Schools, also Virginia Beach Public Schools. I taught first grade, second grade, fifth grade, and I was also an instructional technology specialist. And then I came on over to WHRO to share my knowledge with a, a wider range of people. Um, I, as I'm presenting tonight, I will have a four-year-old here in the house with me, so hopefully he kind of stays up in his room, but in case you hear anything questionable, it may just be him. I'm also a, a little bit congested tonight. It's it's that time of year, unfortunately. So um, I ask that you bear with me and my, my nasally voice tonight and apologies ahead of time for that. Maybe taking a few breaks to sip some water here. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, I would like you on a device to go to slido.com and enter the code you see on the screen, or if you have a cell phone or a tablet, you can hold that up to the QR code that you see on the screen. And I want you to answer this one question I have in this survey. Keep in mind, your answers will show up on this screen for everyone to see. What word first comes to mind when you think of coding? And please be honest, it's okay if it's not a super positive word or if it's um, if coding is something that um, invokes stress or anxiety for you, that's okay. That's why we're here to kind of tame those fears and learn just a little bit more about it. So I'll give everyone uh, about a minute here go ahead and go to slido.com or scan that QR code and let me know what word comes to mind when you think of coding. <laughs> Definitely confusion, especially if you've never done it before. Directions, that's a great one. Coding is all about giving directions to a computer. Zero and one. We're actually gonna talk a little bit about zero and one tonight. Creativity, engagement. I love <laughs> that someone included the word engagement because let me tell you, as a teacher and as a technology specialist, I don't think I've ever seen my students as engaged as I did when they were coding. They love coding. And it, it can be a little stressful for us as teachers, but once we realize you know, how kind of easy it can be, it, it's not so scary anymore. And don't get me wrong, coding can definitely be very difficult as well and challenging and rigorous, but um, it can also be pretty easy. <laughs> I like the one that says, huh? That was certainly me at one point several years ago, never having heard of coding before. Sequence, ooh, women. I'm also going to mention that tonight too. B-bots, oh, you guys have really covered a lot of words that I want to discuss tonight. So this is awesome. It looks like we have a whole lot of um, positive words in here too, which is surprising. I thought we'd be a little more stressed about coding, but I'm glad that we're coming in tonight with a, a really positive outlook on this. And we, it sounds like we're all ready to learn more about coding. So um, as we move on tonight, you know, as usual in professional development sessions, you're going to see a whole lot of resources, a lot of websites, a lot of files, a lot of information. <laughs> it may be overwhelming. I expect it to be overwhelming, but just like in any great session, I don't expect you to leave here tonight and uh, be a master at coding or <laughs> you know, leave here and try to do all of these things in your classroom this week. I am happy if you take just one new idea that you got here tonight and uh, take it to your classroom and try it with your students and really be open to learning how to do it with your students and be open to the possibility of, of some slight failure or um, you know having to adjust a lesson a little bit rather than you know just having a lesson go as you plan. Just like with any other subject, you know, technology and coding can um, go awry at times. And we just, we learn from it. Um, our students learn from us, we learn from them and we move on. Okay, so what is Hour of Code? Hour of Code was started in the year 2013 and it was started by code.org. And it was basically just the, the owners of this, this site, this organization, putting together one single hour of coding for people of all ages, just to show people that coding actually can be easy. Anybody can do it. And you know, the owners of code.org felt like coding is scary. Coding is daunting to people. But if we show people um, how fun it can be, how easy it can be, if we just show them for that one hour out of the whole year, they too can do coding. 
then maybe people will be more likely to code on their own. Maybe they'll be more likely to take coding classes. Maybe they'll be more likely to join coding majors. And that's kind of what this statistic on the screen is right now about the diversity problem that we see in K-12 computer science. Um, only 25% of high school computer science students or university computer science graduates and people employed in tech fields are female. So only 25% of people in computer science are female. That obviously is an issue. And that's one that we can fix if we make sure that in our schools and our classrooms, we are exposing our female students and all of our students to, um, to coding and computer science. And there are some really great groups out there that focus just on getting girls to code. Uh, one of them is actually called Girls Who Code. They're usually at all of the big um, ed tech conferences. They'll, they'll probably be at VISTE coming up. Um, and they do a really great job at trying to get females into this profession. And then further into that statistic at the bottom of the screen, women who try AP computer science in high school are 10 times more likely to major in it. That is wild. So if we just get our, our female students to join a computer science class in high school, they're 10 times more likely to actually pursue that field as um, a career. And also black and Latinx students are seven times more likely. So we really have a job as educators to make sure that we are exposing coding and computer science to all of our students, no matter gender, race, um, you know, socioeconomic status, we, we owe it to our students to make sure that we provide them with these opportunities. And um, Computer Science Week this year is December 6th through 12th, and that's also when Hour of Code takes place. So like I said, Hour of Code is just this, it, it takes place over a whole week, Computer Science Week, but really code.org wants you and your students to code for just one hour that week. Pick one hour of the whole week to code with your kids. And if you can uh, commit more time than an hour, that's wonderful, but we really just wanna to commit to at least an hour. So when I share my slides with you later, um, all of these slides are linked to websites. So I'm going to escape full screen mode here for a second. So um, almost all the pictures that you click on in my presentation have a link that are going to lead you out to another site. So let's go ahead to code.org and check out this Hour of Code site. So, wow, that is a huge number of people who are served in coding. So right here is a map of all of the people in the world who have signed up so far for Hour of Code. I highly suggest that when you have the link to my slides, you go to this, um, this link and this site and you sign up your students for the hour of code. <clears throat> Signing up your students, it really is not a um, like contract commitment. It's really just like a, a personal commitment that you're making. All you do is enter your name, your email address, the country you're in and what type of event you're having. You would choose school. And that's it. And then you basically um, just submit that, you sign up, and that's it. The only reason they have your email address is so that um, they can email you really great hour of code resources in the future. They're not really going to bother you much other than that. They're not going to hold you to a day and a time. They just want to see who all in the world is participating in hour of code. Um, and there are all sorts of tweets down here from other people participating in Hour of Code so that you can get some ideas and see what other people are doing. Um, some more statistics and some frequently asked questions so that you can be prepared to give your students all of the information that they might need. All right. So tonight, if I can get 
back here. Hold on one second. Okay, my toolbar was covering my tabs and I couldn't get back to where I needed. All right, so tonight we are going to focus on a couple of different coding resources and activities. The very first activity I want to show you is an unplugged coding activity. And this kind of seems like an oxymoron because when you think coding, you think robots, computers, tablets, devices, all of that. But coding actually does not have to start on computers and, and robots. Coding can start with some really basic um, uh, tangibles that you have in your classroom or in your home. You can do coding activities where you don't have to have kids on a computer. You know, maybe, maybe you're at a school that doesn't have one-to-one -one devices all day, every day. Um, or you just want to get your kids off of, off of the screen for a little bit. I'm going to show you three activities that you can do without even touching a computer or tablet or phone or robot or anything like that. All right, so the first is called binary bracelets. And this is one of my absolute favorites. I have done this with students in kindergarten and I've done this with students in middle school and students of all ages have seemed to enjoy this. I particularly loved it for our younger students though because um, I think it was a really great way to introduce students to binary coding. Uh, before they actually get onto the computer. And it's really, really simple. Binary coding is the, um, the zeros and the ones, which we actually saw in that word cloud earlier. And um, students will probably do this whole activity and not even know they're coding. Um, it's, it's that unique. Of course, we do want to tell them they're coding so that you know we start getting those vocabulary words into their brain. Um, for when we do start having them code on computers, but it's, it's a really simple activity. So here's the basis of it. What you would want is um, this key right here to either be printed out on sheets of paper so that your students can use them, or you could just project it up onto a board or a screen in your classroom if you don't wanna waste the paper. You're also going to need to give each student a string that will fit around their wrist. That's what this is at the bottom. And you're also going to want a whole bunch of black and white beads. Uh, they really could be any color, but in the key they're black and white. So it makes it easier if the beads are black and white. And I just used black and white pony beads that I found at like Michael's or Amazon or something. So students are going to be binary coding the letters in their name. My first name is Janie. So I'm going to start with the letter J and let me look over here at J. Here's the code for letter J. It goes black, white, black, black, white, black, white, black. So first, oops, I guess I have to get out of full screen mode. So first I'm going to take a black bead and put it on my string and then a white bead because that's what comes next in the code. And then two more black beads, black, black, and then white, black, white, black. And we're saying um, the colors white and black, but we could also, as we're doing this with our students, be using terms like zero, one, zero, one. So that's just the J. Then I'm not going to do it for the sake of time, but next I would move on to A because that is the second letter in my name. And I would put these eight beads on the string. And then I would go through my whole name. And then when my whole binary bracelet is finished, I of course would walk around and help the students tie the knot on their string. And then they have a, a bracelet that they can wear around from here on out. <laughs> my students loved this and I saw them wearing their bracelets for the rest of the year in class. <laughs> and the really cool thing was that I, um, I was using Class Dojo at the time and we would Class Dojo the parents and say, hey, look for this bracelet on your child's wrist today. Um, it may just look like a decorative bracelet, but here's actually what we did. Your student was coding. 
And then the students got to go home and share with their, um, their guardians what their bracelet meant and how they coded the different letters of their name. And they might even throw a few vocabulary words in there like binary and um, sequence because they had to sequence and go in order to spell out their name. And that's exactly what we want. We just wanna start getting students to do something in order from start to finish because sequence and order is really important in coding. And we just wanna start putting some of these words into their mind. Um, another tip for this, uh, which I wrote in the notes, is that for younger students, sometimes pipe cleaner is easier uh, because they're not great at keeping beads on strings. <laughs> so we had a couple of accidents and tears where all the beads flew off the strings. So sometimes pipe cleaner is a little more of a stress-free way to do this, but uh, you know, whatever floats your boat, um, you can be creative with this, of course. And uh, I mean, you could also, it, it's not as fun when there's not an actual bracelet to take at the end, but you could also do this digitally like I just showed you if you wanted to. Um, and like most of my slides, if you click on the key for the binary bracelets, it's going to give you a link to where I found the lesson plan for this activity. This is actually a lesson plan from code.org. I'm telling you, that's a great website. They've got games, lesson plans, just you name it, it's there. And um, the whole lesson plan is right here in case you forget anything I say. There's even more in this lesson plan than I mentioned. All of the files you would need, all of the computer science standards are listed here. ISTE standards, everything you need to do this lesson is right here, including a nice big vocabulary word card if you wanted to print that out and include it in your lesson. And there are some videos, assessments, worksheets, all sorts of stuff, whatever you need. Okay, so we're going to move on to yet another, let me see if I can get this guy full screen. All right, this one is called Getting Loopy. And this is another unplugged activity that you can use with your students. And basically you're just going to help your students create a dance. So you might for this lesson want some uh, music in the classroom. And you're also going to want to take some pictures of yourself or someone else, whatever this teacher used herself, um, doing some different dance moves. And they're really easy. As you can see, there's a clap, hands on waist, hands behind head, real simple things. And you'll want to print these out and uh, cut them up. You might want a couple of sets of these so that you can divide your students into groups for this activity. And this activity is going to focus on something called loops. When we are talking about coding, loops are when you perform the same action more than once. So for example, the first part of our dance is clap, clap, clap. Well, that's a loop because we did the clap dance move three times in a row. So we wanna show our students, hey, instead of putting the clap picture down three times in a row, we can just get rid of these two pictures and just write a little times three before the one clapping picture. So now when somebody looks at this code or this dance, they see times three, clap, and they still know that they do clap, clap, clap. Times three clap is showing us the same thing as clap, clap, clap. So you might wanna show your students this whole set first and maybe do this together as a class and then go to the next row and say, all right, where can we um, cut out some cards here? Obviously you would cut out these two and then in the beginning you might write times two. So you know you're going to do behind head and waist two times, behind head, waist, behind head, waist. So what I would do is go through, I would do this one as a whole class, go through all four of these rows with our students, 
together talk about what we can get rid of. This would be another times three, and this would be another times two. And then I would give some of these cards to the students in small groups, and I would let them come up with some dances of their own, but require that their dance has at least one loop in it, or I don't know, maybe at least two loops in it, or whatever you feel is appropriate for your students. And then um, if it's appropriate for your classroom, then maybe you can actually put on some music and have those small groups uh, perform their dances for the rest of the class. And then of course, your students would wanna show the rest of the class uh, their coding that they did as well. And if you click on this boom box, you're going to get a link for the lesson plan for this lesson as well. And one last um, unplugged activity here is a really simple card game. Um, so this is teaching our students conditionals. And when we are talking about coding, conditionals, another vocabulary word that's important, Conditionals are when we say if, then, or if else. So for example, if I draw a red card, oh, by the way, you'll need a deck of cards for this, but really nothing else. If I draw a red card, everyone claps their hands. Else, everyone snaps their fingers. Or you might wanna say, or else, everyone snaps their fingers. That wording can be a little bit awkward, but that is the wording used in coding, which is why it's worded this way. So then you would pick a card. And if it were the um, ace that we see on top, then the whole class should be snapping their fingers because it's not red, it's else. Everyone snaps their fingers, it's a black card. Or you might say, if I draw an ace, two, three, four, five, or six, everyone does jumping jacks or else everyone touches their toes. And um, this is really great for a brain break in your classroom, or if you happen to be a PE teacher, really great activity that combines physical activity and coding together. So let's practice one of these really quick in our chat, and then we're going to move on to a different type of coding. All right, I think I have to get out of full screen for this. So if I draw, why? There we go. If I draw an even number or a face card, everyone comments their favorite food in our chat. Else, everyone comments their favorite animal in the chat. So I'm going to draw a card. Here it is, eight of hearts. So if you think you're confident, you can answer in our chat. If this number is even, or a face card, comment your favorite food. Otherwise, comment your favorite animal. Perfect, I see lots of food comments coming in because this card is an even number. So we're doing the if. If I draw an even number, which I did, we comment our favorite food. Oh man, lots of pizzas, lots of tacos. Oh my gosh. Now I'm getting hungry. I would have to agree that mine is definitely pizza. Although I saw crab cakes come in and I do love a good crab cake sandwich from Wicker's Crab Pot, but that's conversation for a different time. So let's go ahead and move on. All right, so that was just getting us started. Now I wanna move on to um, the big stuff. I wanna move on to the block coding, which you may have heard of. And this is the coding where we actually use a computer and we tell the computer what to do. And it hopefully listens to us and responds in the way that we want it to. So I'm going to start out with the easiest block coding I could think of which are coding games. There are tons and tons and tons of games on the internet used for coding. And I find that this is another really easy way to get students interested in coding because our kids love games. My gosh, like, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a teacher, we had Go Guardian so we could watch all of our students' screens. And there was not a second of the day where I didn't see at least one kid in like, 
Prodigy or some other game site while I was, you know, trying to teach. And instead of letting that bother us and make us crazy, we can just embrace that and, and give our students games that are actually appropriate to their, their development and their learning. And that's what coding games can do for us too. So I'm going to show you two examples of coding games. The first I'm going to show you is Code Monster, but just like all of my other slides, all of these resources have links when you click on them. I picked the easiest, excuse me, and the most appropriate coding game websites that I could find. And these are all coding sites that I have used before um, with students in elementary school as well as high school. So of course, always check sites before you give them to your own students, but most of what you find on these sites are going to be appropriate for your kids. So um, I wish we could go through all of them tonight. That would be crazy. I'm going to show you two of them. The first one I'm going to show you is very simple and it's called Code Monster. Code Monster discovers JavaScript coding, which in my opinion, for me personally, is the absolute hardest type of coding. That's the kind of coding where like you're in Microsoft Word and you, abs you accidentally hit something on your keyboard and you don't know what it was. And all of a sudden your whole screen is these like weird codes that don't make any sense at all. And there's just like a bunch of nonsense words and numbers and you panic and don't know what to do. So that's what JavaScript coding is, at least for me. So I legitimately as an adult use Code Monster to learn JavaScript myself. So I'm uh, in my 30s adult and I'm using this, but I've also given this to first graders and they've used it successfully too. So these tools I'm showing you tonight really, um, first of all, they're all free, which I forgot to mention. <laughs> and second, um, really cover a, a grade range of students. So I'm Code Monster. Click on my words to see what's next. You're going to learn some programming. This is JavaScript coding, and on the right is what it does. You can use this to draw a box. See the number 50? Can you change that to 150? So it starts very, very simple. I'm going to change 50 to 150. And you should notice that my box got a little bit bigger, and Code Monster says, great. You did it. So right away, students are noticing. I told the computer to do something. I put in a variable. I changed a number. When I did that, when I entered information, something on the computer changed. What I did affected what is on the screen. And that's what coding is all about. Telling the computer to do something and then the computer doing it in the order that you asked. That made the box wider. What do you think the other numbers do? This could be a great spot for a discussion if you're doing this whole class or students could be doing this on their own as well. It says, try changing those other uh, numbers. So now students are going to be exploring a little bit. Let's see what the first one does if I change it to 70. So it looks like the box moved over a little bit. Let's change this number to, I don't know, 10. Oh, so that made the box shorter and thinner. Okay. Did you figure it out? The numbers are how far from the left side to draw the box and how far from the top, how wide to draw the box and how tall. Try changing all the numbers, play. Two boxes. Can you change the numbers to make them bigger? So now you can see it's progressing a little bit where um, instead of having one object on our screen, we have two objects. And now we look at the code, we notice that there are two lines of code and we can play with these a little bit and see how um, changing different lines of code might affect different objects on the screen. So I'm not really going to go too much further than this because I want to move on, but Code Monster is truly as easy as it looks. Um, I, I suggest trying it yourself 
especially to get a little more comfortable with uh, JavaScript. I do it all the time. The other day I was refreshing myself with Code Monster so that I was prepared for this presentation. And somehow I ended up playing with it for 45 minutes. So it, <laughs> it gets pretty addictive. Um, and as you can imagine, the, the kids love it too. Okay, so another coding game I wanna show you is um, a block coding game. And block coding games are really going to suck in your students. And again, maybe you too, because I played the Minecraft block coding game. I played a Grinch one. I played a Frozen one. And like two hours later, I had like defeated all these games and I had like five certificates. It was wild, but it was so fun. <laughs> and also when I was a technology specialist at Virginia Beach, every year during Hour of Code, um, we would have like a big technology specialist meeting and they would actually have us, the adult specialists, um, do like a coding competition. And these are the exact kinds of games that we would do and we would win like gift cards and stuff. It was a blast. And hey, if you're an administrator in here, that might be a really great idea for um, your school, for your staff to get your, your staff more comfortable with coding and more open to it. Or maybe if you're like a, a technology specialist or something, <clears throat> maybe you could do some sort of coding game competition where it's friendly and there's nothing to lose. It's, it's not a high stakes environment and the winner gets some sort of uh, small prize or something. All right, so I'm gonna click on the Minecraft one. <clears throat> this game is on code.org. And there's a little video here that I'm actually going to skip, but uh, this guy just kind of talks to you about computer science and Minecraft and stuff like that. I'm sure you've heard of Minecraft before because it's like the thing with students. They love Minecraft. So, you know, combining coding standards and Minecraft together, mm, it's a, a done deal. Uh, let's go ahead and be Steve. All right, oh, there's some great music in the background and it gives us some directions. Hit run when you're ready to try out your program and add a second move forward block to reach the sheep. So there's every step of this game, which you can kind of see in the background, um, is going to have really vivid directions so that you and your students are not lost. There are always really, really good directions on what to do. So we want to add move forward block to reach the sheep. Okay. So these are called blocks. And these blocks, when we move them over to the workspace, tell our guy, Steve, over here what to do. So when we hit that, what's that yellow orange run button, he's going to move forward. But the directions told us we want him to move forward two times so that he'll hit the sheep. Let's see what happens. We did it. Yay, we did puzzle one. We could play it again if we wanted to, or we can continue to the next one. And you can see up here, there's a whole bunch of puzzles in this game. There's 14 and it's going to give us steps, um, directions every step of the way. And it's also going to um, get increasingly harder in each step. Wood is a very important resource. Many things are made from it. Walk to the tree and use the destroy block to chop it down. So here's our guy. It looks like to get to the tree, we're going to have to move forward one, two times. I got that number from these little blocks that you can see on the screen, one, two. So move forward once, move forward twice. And then the directions told me to use the destroy block to chop the tree down. Destroy block. And your blocks all snap together like this. If your block is over here, not snapped, it won't work. It has to be snapped into the others. Let's see if we um, were able to do this. We did it. Now, you might already be thinking, and hopefully you are, hey, I see some loops. Just like we talked about in the, uh, the dance unplugged activity, 
And you're absolutely right. And loops are totally going to come in and make a play at some point during this game. So maybe your students would already point out to you if they have some of that coding vocabulary, hey, can we loop this? And you can say, great job using that word loop. Yes, you can. Let's continue the game to see if we um, can loop those actions. Let's see. Use the shear command to gather wool from the sheep. So here's our guy. I want to move forward two times. And then I'll be at the sheep. So I want to shear him. So if I move forward two times, one, two, and I'm facing that sheep, in order to get to the next sheep, <clears throat> I'm going to have to make a turn to the right. As you can see, coding really is heavy on sequence and thinking ahead and planning and deciding where you're going to be and what code, what block you need to put in there next. So after I turn right, I think I'll have to move forward one time. Then I'll be at this sheep and I can shear this sheep. How about though, let's take this last shear off and just see what happens if we do it wrong. Because we know we will make mistakes and our students will make mistakes too. Uh-oh, so I didn't quite get it. So um, I have some new directions up here that are telling me how I can fix my issue. So let's add that shear block, reset and try again. Perfect. Our guy, Steve, is doing exactly what we told him to do. We are entering code, we're entering block code. We're doing it in sequence, in order. And when we hit run or start, Steve, the computer, is doing those actions in order the way that we told him to do them. And we are accomplishing a task of shearing these sheep by entering code into our computer. Um, and that's what coding is all about entering commands, the computer reading those commands, and then the computer responding in the way that you told it to. Let's move on to uh, one more level and see if we can catch some looping, hopefully. Um, and I see somebody asked, is this able to be done in Spanish? Ooh, that is a really, really great question. I don't believe that this website has a, um, a, oh, no, wait, look. Yay, look, it does. It looks like you can choose any language down here in the corner, which makes sense since code.org has a map of the entire world. Perfect. So the answer to your question is yes. Okay. Let's see. Um, we need to build a house before the sun goes down. Houses require wood, cut down all of the trees. And it looks like some of the blocks are already there for us. Forward, 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 destroy, turn left, move forward. I think I'm gonna have to go forward two more times. Destroy. And then I think I'm going to have to turn left because I'm going to be right here. So turn left, move forward one, two, three times. <coughs> Man, some of these codes really get hefty too. Look at this. You really get carried away. All right. I really hope I did that right because this is a long code. <laughs> Oh, and there's another video. 
of someone talking to us. Ooh, perfect, the looping. So this is going to be the last one I do in the Minecraft game because I uh, definitely want to show you the looping. So looping, just like in the dancing game, is when we um, we have a, an action that we want to do several times. So in the last level, we had to drag move forward out here three times in a row for our guy Steve to move three times. That's a bit much. Instead of having to drag that block out three times, we can use one of these pink repeat or loop blocks and tell him, hey, move forward four times or move forward two times, move forward nine times, instead of having to drag the move forward block out nine times in a row. Uh, for this level though, it wants us to do four. So when we click run, he should move forward four times. Oops, I think he was supposed to stay in the dirt. Wait, place your blocks on the dirt outline to build the wall. Oh, I'm supposed to build a wall. So you can put two of these in here as well. And maybe three times, I don't know. So place a plank, move forward. So he should do place, move forward, place, move forward, place, move forward. It should have been four. So bad at this, but that's okay. I'm learning. And see, this is why I don't want you to be afraid. And this is why I want you to try this on your own and learn from these sites and learn from your students because I just messed up that one twice in a row and I'm the one teaching you how to do this. <laughs> but I persisted and I did it and now I can move on to the next one, but I'm not actually going to because I want to move on from these games. All right. Let's close that guy out and get back here. So every time you do complete one of those games and you get all the way to that very last level, uh, code.org and most of those websites that I showed over here are going to give a certificate. So the students, it's like, congratulations, type in your name. You type in your first and your last name or just your first. And it gives you this little certificate and um, students can save that on their device or take a screenshot and put it in their um, I don't know, class dojo or seesaw or whatever. You can print them out, whatever you want to do with those. So I also want to move on quickly to block coding from scratch. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is one step higher than just the block coding games. But I do want to show you that you can block code, um, not just in a game, but you can create like videos and games from just a blank screen. So blocks are just like what we saw in the Minecraft game, those little colorful pieces that we drag over to our workplace that look like this to make our little characters do something. Here are um, two things that I have created with block coding from complete scratch. So I started on like a blank screen, a blank canvas, and I created these two little animations from nothing. And these are actually animations that I have used in class with my students. So I coded this little water cycle and uh, I did this myself and I showed it to my students, we talked about it. And then I let my students go onto a coding website and I let them try to recreate this one. So very simple, just that little water drop moving around through the cycle, but that was all done with block coding. And then I did this guy too, which was like a quadrilateral um, lesson, not a whole lesson, but part of a lesson. So I coded this little guy to come in and then I coded some shapes to show up, click on the quadrilaterals, so then the students had to actually move their mouse and click on them. I clicked on the square. 
some information came up about the square. And then I went back to the home screen, clicked on the rectangle, info came up about the rectangle. These are both ones that I have made, but these are easily projects that a student can make too once they learn how to block code. So we don't have a ton of time left, but I am going to show you how to block code from scratch. <clears throat> we are not going to get something done like what you saw on the last screen. Those took me a little bit of time, maybe like a half hour to an hour. And that's coming from me, someone who knows what they're doing. So that may take someone new a little bit longer. Coding from scratch is definitely a project that I would give my students over like a week or, or two weeks. I wouldn't say, hey, sit down in this one hour and code a whole project. That's something I would definitely let my students continue. However, an hour of code is a great place to get them started on that project. So here are my three favorite websites that I use for block coding from scratch. They're all wonderful. They all do the same thing. Today, I'm going to show you Scratch, <laughs> which is the name of the program. So when you're in Scratch, you can click on create. You can create um, login information if you want to, but you do not have to. There is a tutorial once you get in here. <clears throat> We're going to skip that for now. All right, so this is going to be very basic and it's only going to be a few minutes, but it will get you the point. Already you see a little character, just like we saw in the game. In the game, we had Steve. In um, our Scratch coding, we have, uh, uh, Cat, I don't know his name, we'll call him Cat. So Cat, our character, that's actually called a Sprite. So you're gonna see the word Sprite down here. Not only is it a tasty, delicious beverage, but it is also the name of a character or picture or image when you're coding. So he is a Sprite. If I would like to add another image or another Sprite, I can, choose a new sprite. I can upload a picture that I have saved on my device, which is really cool. So like if I wanted to, I could upload a picture of myself and I could be one of the characters in here with Kat moving around on the screen. Um, I can click surprise and it will give me something random. <clears throat> I can draw something. I think that's what I did for the, uh, the raindrop that you saw. I just drew that raindrop with a paint tool. Um, or I can choose from a whole library of stuff that's already in here. So um, I don't know, let's choose crab. I'm a cancer, so we'll choose crab. And there's crab. And you should notice as you move your sprites around the screen, you'll see that they're, um, where they're at on the axis, these numbers are moving. So if I move him further down into the left, these numbers go greater into the negatives. If I move him up here, they're going to go higher up into the positives. Um, just imagine there's a grid there that you can't see. If I only want one of these, if I don't want cat anymore, I just want my crab, I can just get rid of this sprite. And here's my crab, okay? So here are all of our blocks over here. And this is how I tell my crab what I want him to do. Oh, but first, probably the most important part, cool background. Again, you could upload a picture or something from your device, but let's put this guy on a beach because he is a crab. And I'm just going to do something really simple for tonight. I'm just going to try to make him walk across the screen. So we're always going to start with yellow, which is when start is clicked or when go is clicked. Here's our like go button, this little green flag. So when start is clicked, what do I want him to do? Scratch has an overwhelming amount of options. <laughs> so just start with the basics. And then as you get better at coding, start exploring some of the others. Um, I can make him say something. Sure, let's make him say hello when start is clicked. Hello. <laughs> um, I can have him, let's see, motion. Let's have him move. 
move 10 steps. Let's see what happens. He should say hello and he should move 10 steps. Oh, there. He said hello first and then he moved 10 steps. It was really hard to see because 10 steps apparently is not far. I'm going to change it to 100 steps and I think we'll see a noticeable difference this time. So, hello. Whoa, he moved 100 steps. And there are all sorts of other options for like, you know, you can make him go slower and faster. Um, there are sounds that play. <laughs> so he said, hello, he made a pop sound and then he moved. Um, tons of these that we can do. We can also, let's see, here's the loop. In Scratch, the loops are orange. So this will be really obnoxious. So I apologize ahead of time, but uh, if we want that pop sound to play 10 times, we can make the pop sound play 10 times just by moving pop into the loop block. All right, this is gonna be obnoxious, I'm sorry. <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> and uh, we would just have to move him back over here manually when we're done if we want him to start from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of really in-depth blocks where you can make these guys move around and appear and disappear and talk to each other. It can get really intense and confusing, or it can just be really simple like this, a crab on a beach saying hello and moving across the screen. And I'm sure as the teachers that you are, you're probably thinking of like a hundred different topics um, from SOLs you cover every day that you could use scratch for uh, because you can. You, anything you teach, you can find a way to build something in scratch. This is definitely something that I would do whole class with the students once and then give them a simple task of something to build. You know, you're going to have to show them here's the blocks, here's what they do, here's how you use them, here's how you start them. But the students pick up on this very, 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 very quickly. And um, once you let them run with it, believe me, they're going to run with it and they're going to create some um, products that are just beyond your wildest dreams because they're good at this, they like this, and they learn it quickly. And uh, you'd be surprised. You'll learn it very quickly too once you get started with this. All right. Our time is just about up and I do see some questions. I promise I will answer them, but I just want to get these last couple of notes in here really quick. First, um, I just want to let you know that there is something called Scratch Junior. Unfortunately, it's not a website. It's an app. So you have to have like a, a Chromebook or a tablet or something to be able to download it. It's a scaled back version of what I just showed you on Scratch. Much easier to use for really young students. And they have a PBS version, which we love to use because we are uh, WHR of PBS station. So keep Scratch Junior in mind. That's a really wonderful resource as well. And we use that with very young students. I've made this hour of code choice board for you that I would love for you to steal and use with your students. Um, I would love, um, or like what I used to do for hour of code is I would give the link to this out to my students in their learning management system. And I would say, all right, we're going to do an hour of code. You can choose whatever activities you want to do, but you have to be doing one of these activities. I don't care which one it is or which two or whatever, but you have to be doing one of these. Um, definitely use this with your kids. Just beware. The first column I have here are those unplugged activities I showed you. So make sure if you use this exact chart, you have all of these materials prepared or just take that column out and, and then use it. I would definitely check to make sure that these are all going to be appropriate for your students. I feel that they are, but um, you know your students best. Don't use anything without checking it first. I also wanted to do an honorable mention. I feel like the next step in coding is using robots. 
And all of these robots that are on the screen are actually, well, not all of them. Most of them are controlled by block coding, which I showed you today. These are all robots that I have used with elementary students because I was an elementary teacher. Um, I've used these with students as low as kindergarten, no, pre-K actually, the pre-K students would use these. Um, some of them are simpler than others. I'm not going to talk about them, but if you feel like you're you know, a coding expert and you're ready to move on to the next step, see if you have any of these in your school or see if maybe there's a grant you can write or, uh, or something that can get you started on these. This slide just has a bunch of free resources from code.org. They have a bunch of free posters that you can hang in your classroom or your school. There are stickers you can print, uh, banners and things you can put on social media, all sorts of cool things in there to get your staff and your students excited about coding. Um, and of course, if you click on it, it's linked to all that cool stuff. This picture is linked out to um, a Teachers Pay Teachers free resource. These are vocabulary cards that cover all of those really important coding vocabulary words. You can use them with your students virtually or hang them in your classroom. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip over that Slido. And the only homework I have for you is that I, I want you to try coding. I would love you to try it by yourself. Try out some of those games when you have a couple of minutes of free time and then try them out with your students too. They're really, really fun. Some are harder than others, but that's how we learn and grow is from a challenge. I'm going to go ahead and stick around and answer some questions. If you've got to head out, feel free to go. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I hope you learned something. I hope you're going to participate in Hour of Code. I'm going, or I'm not going to, Zoom is going to uh, send you an email tomorrow that has the link to my slides and also has a link to my survey. But um, if you'd rather get it out of the way now, you can use the QR code that's up on the screen to take that survey and get that certificate at the end. Once again, if there are any issues with that survey at all, please let me know. I think it's good to go, but it is my first time using that uh, software. So just in case, just shoot me an email if there's any sort of issue with that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead to the Q&A and I'll open the chat as well. Spanish, I already answered. Will we get a copy of this presentation? Absolutely, I just uh, answered that, but in the email Zoom sends you tomorrow, you'll have a slide to my, or sorry, a link to my Google Slides and it will um, prompt you to make a copy for yourself. I believe the end of the survey might also have the link for my slides. What is the main difference between Scratch and Scratch Junior? Does it read to them thinking first grade? For first grade, I would definitely use Scratch Junior as long as you have access to um, like tablets or something because Scratch Junior, like I said, is not a website. It's an app that has to be downloaded. But if you have iPads or Chromebooks or something like that, you should be able to get it no problem. Scratch Junior is just much easier to use. I don't believe there are any read to them options unless your device has some sort of read aloud software on it. Um, but it has way less blocks on it. There are only a few blocks for students to choose from. So it's much less overwhelming and um, the PBS version of Scratch Junior has a lot of the main PBS characters, which is really cool because, um, you know, since PBS is on everyone's TV, our students are usually pretty familiar with those characters and they like to see those PBS characters on there. But that's the big difference. Just one is much simpler. Um, I would definitely use Scratch Junior with first graders. I think somewhere around third grade is usually when I started moving up to, to scratch with some of those older students. Um, in the chat, someone said, Teachers Pay Teachers also has free bookmarks to print for Hour of Code. Awesome, that is really cool. If you could print those bookmarks and then um, 
uh, like laminate them or just print them on cardstock or something and, and give those to kids. That's really cool too. And also I didn't mention this, but, uh, you know, reach out to, to parents, reach out to home, let them know that their students are coding, let them know what they've been working on in school. They, you know, parents love to hear what's going on in school, especially when it's something that sounds as difficult as coding. How would you set up the staff competition? So what we did when we had this competition between technology specialists is the, um, our supervisors picked out a game and we all had to do the same game. So say it was the Minecraft game I showed you. They were like, um, here's, here's the game. They showed it to us on like a projector on a big screen. I think they played like one level of it to kind of do like modeling, like, Hey, here's the game. Here's, you know, an example of how you play it. We're going to send you all, we're going to email you all the link to this Minecraft game. And as soon as you get in and get that link, you can get started. Then they set a time limit. Uh, I want to say it was like 20 minutes maybe because we were adults who were all pretty tech savvy and whoever reached the highest level during that 20 minutes was the winner. And I think for us, they have like three winners, whoever had the top three highest levels. And, uh, and then we got like gift cards or something like that. So obviously you would want to adjust this to your staff. I think that Minecraft game is actually pretty easy. So that's a good one to choose, but definitely go in there, pick an appropriate game that would be easy for your staff to compete in, um, set a time limit that you think is appropriate for them. Maybe it's during a staff meeting. So you just want it to be like 10 minutes or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and go from there. And, you know, if you have any questions or need any help with that in the future, feel free to reach out to me, of course. All right. Well, I don't see any questions aside the ones that I answered. And I have a four-year-old saying, mom. <laughs> so I'm going to head out for the night. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, issues with the survey, issues with slides, anything you need, reach out to me. Let me put my email address in the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and close this session in about 30 seconds. Everyone have a really great night and have a great computer science week. Happy hour of code.